Uh, welcome everybody. This is the Archaeology Nonprofit Community Programs Forum. Uh, struggle to keep archaeology important in the eyes of the public. I am Tom Cuthbertson. I work for Thunderbird Archaeology in Gainesville, Virginia. Um, and our session organizer is Dr. Alexander Jones from Archaeology in the Community. Um, I'm just going to introduce myself and, and our panel real quick. Uh, I said I'm Tom Cuthbertson. Uh, I'm an associate archaeologist with Thunderbird Archaeology, Division of Weapons Studies. Incorporated. Uh, I got my MAMA from uh, William Mary in 2016. I'm an RPA. Uh, I've been doing CRM archaeology for about eight years now. Uh, I have worked with Montpelier, Mount Vernon, Fairfax County, uh, all of which have had um, the community archaeology elements, uh, public outreach elements, uh, and most recently I've been working with Dr. Jones uh, and with AIPC uh, doing community archaeology and education uh, programs. Dr. Jones is the founder of Archaeology and Community and has been an educator for more than 17 years. She has taught in multiple education environments, from primary schools to museums, colleges, and camps. She obtained a dual bachelor's of art degrees from Howard University in History and Anthropology in 2001. Effort to further her career as a teacher, she continued with her education by attaining a master's degree in history from Howard University in 2003 and then attending University of California, Berkeley to obtain a PhD in historical archaeology. Currently teaches people of all ages about archaeology. Uh, is an assistant professor at Baltimore City Community College and an adjunct professor at the University of Baltimore, Baltimore and Morgan State University. Uh, Terry Brock, next to mine, uh, is the assistant director of archaeology at the Mount Pelier Foundation and serves on the board of archaeology in the community. Uh, he received his PhD from Michigan State University in anthropology and has been doing public archaeology since 2010. In addition to the public work. Uh, that they do at Montpelier. He has also done a great deal of digital public archaeology as an early adopter of social media and arch uh, for archaeology and was the co-founder of RVA Archaeology and Archaeology and Archaeology Advocacy Group in Richmond, Virginia. Um, Dr. Patricia Sanford is next. Uh, uh, Dr. Sanford, Sanford is the director of the American, Maryland Archaeological excuse me, Maryland Archaeological Conservation Laboratory at Jefferson Patterson Park and Museum. She's been engaged in community and public archaeology throughout her career, which includes working for the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation and the North Carolina Department of Natural and Cultural Resources. She has an article on a, on a community archaeology project and an upcoming publication entitled New Life for Old Collections, co-edited by Rebecca Allen and Ben Ford. Dr. Elizabeth Pruitt has been the SAA Manager of Education and Outreach for two years. Before that, she worked with National Park Service and the Archaeology an Annapolis project uh, connecting communities in D.C. and Maryland. Uh, she started out in public archaeology as an undergraduate student with the campus archaeology project at Michigan State University. Um, uh, Dr. Eleanor Green, next, uh, is a historical archaeologist with two decades of experience in public archaeology. As a city archaeologist, Eleanor currently directs the, uh, the unique community archaeology program that preserves and interprets Alexandria's history. Uh, their programs remain unique in the country as it partners with developers uh, and the community to steward the past for the future. Over the past year, this unique partnership has led to a monumental archaeological effort, uh, leading to the most exciting and significant discoveries, a virtually intact block representing Alexandria's seafaring history. The remains of wharves, warehouses, dwellings, industries, privies, well over 100,000 artifacts, and three ships have emerged uh, from the waterlogged depths of the Potomac River's edge. These discoveries, especially the centuries-old ships, have captured the attention of local residents as well as members of our global community in 2018. Alexandria, uh, in global community. In 2018, Alexandria Archaeology offered a new STEM-based shift, excuse me, STEM-based shift science lesson in Alexandria City Public Schools and surrounding uh, counties, reaching over 650 students. Created. New exhibits uh, related to the waterfront excavation to share Alexandria's history with over 45,000 residents and visitors from around the world, and have and shared recent discoveries with over 3,200 members of the public by offering a shipbuilding event in April uh, to inspire future generations. Before
Port County to Alexandria. Eleanor led the archaeology division at Mount Vernon George Washington Plantation, as well as a degree in anthropology from College of William Mary and the University of Massachusetts Boston and the University of Tennessee Knoxville. Uh, most recently, uh, Eleanor partnered with Dr. Barbara Heath and uh, Lori Lorimi uh, to uh, publish the edited volume Material Worlds, Archaeology, Consumption, and the Road to Modernity. Modernity. Eleanor lives with her family in a historic neighborhood of Alexandria, Virginia. And if you have any questions about the site, the archaeological site that Tom was talking about, you can ask Tom. <laughs> it, 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 was, it was Thunderbird. Um, that, did the, that was contracted to do the excavations of this uh, waterfront block. That was a project. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of stuff. <laughs> uh, next we have Dr. Della Scott Ireton. Uh, Dr. Scott Ireton graduated from the University of West Florida with a bachelor's degree in anthropology and a master's degree in historical archaeology. She also has a master's in inter international relations from Troy University and a PhD in anthropology from Florida State University. Della is certified as a scuba instructor with the National Association of Underwater Instructors, and uh, she worked with Pensacola Shipwreck Survey, West Florida Historic Preservation Inc., Florida Bureau of Archaeological Research, and the gov uh, government of the Cayman, Cayman Islands before joining the Florida Public Archaeology Network, where she serves as an associate director. Della is a registered professional archaeologist and member of the Florida Archaeological Council, and has served on the board of Society for Historical Archaeology, the advisory council for under uh, the Advisory Council on Underwater Archaeology and the Marine Protected Areas Federal Ad Advisory Committee. Bella's research interests include public interpretation of maritime cultural heritage, both on land and underwater, and training engaged citizen scientists in archaeological methods and practices. And last but not least is Dr. Eric Larson. Uh, he first started in public archaeology with NPS at Harpers Ferry. He was unofficially the coordinator for public programs. In 1993, he had the chance to do an oral history and um, to do an oral history an individual who grew up in one of the buildings we were uh, they were studying on Virginius 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 Island, Virginius Island. that was my introduction to, to his introduction <laughs> um, to community archaeology. In 1994, he began working with archaeology in Annapolis and worked with the African American. Community research or African American community researching the neighborhood that was once part of the Anne Arundel County Courthouse Block. He's been working at at community archaeology ever since. Germanic Foundation was first organized in 1956, and as a descendant group from the first two um, descendant group of the first two colonies of German settlers brought brought to Germana. The foundation hired him in 2014 to begin a long-term community project at Germana that will involve the descendants finding new descendants and incorporating the surrounding community. Uh, and I just wanted to kind of open up the floor to then if anybody has any opening statements they want to make or uh, points they want to raise. Otherwise, we have discussion questions that we can cover. Sorry, this is fairly organic. We're good. Ready to start with the questions? Cool. Sure. All right. All right. <laughs> Let's define our terms, I suppose. Uh, how should community <coughs> archaeology and public archaeology be defined? Should there be a difference between public and I've always thought of public archaeology as kind of being the big tent and community archaeology being a more specific kind of public archaeology. So public archaeology could span anywhere from the interpretive sign to, you know, fully community-led and community-engaged archaeological research and um, stuff like that. So that's how I've always kind of thought about it. So all community archaeology is public archaeology, but not all public archaeology is community. I also tend to, whenever I think about the two, um, I think of public archaeology in the sense that it's us telling or kind of placing what is important onto the public versus community, it's it's that um, balance between what do you think is important, let's use our scientific skills to then, you know, kind of lend knowledge or add to what we already know. But I always feel like uh, public seems to be more top down versus community is more spread out and kind of there's more equity in what the interest is and what's important to the people versus the other. So that community archaeology would be a more collaborative yes. type of archaeology from from the beginning mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to telling telling people what you want them to know. And I think that that's 
it's not necessarily one isn't necessarily better than the other in some ways. I mean, mm -hmm. the, right, and, and you know, working at a museum, there's only so much, you know, like, we need to have landscape signs right, <laughs> out there, you know, because people are going to walk up to an uh, archaeology site that you can't see, and there's not going to be someone there to do some kind of collaboratively engaged interpretation of that spot, right? But you need something. Um, to uh, to get across what's you know what needs to what what is there that you can't see, so um, I always think about it as a spectrum, and that there's it's not necessarily it's not necessarily bad or good. It's how many different kinds of ways can you can you be engaging the public, right? doing as many as you possibly can, because the context might beg for a different kind of engagement. I'd throw it too that these are these subtle differences are something that we talk about and understand, but I think the publics we engage with don't necessarily understand <clears throat> these subtleties. You know, there's there's subtle but crucial differences in underwater nautical and maritime archaeology that only we care. You know, so <laughs> to, to the general public, it's all the same thing. Mm -hmm. But they do notice sometimes when you're doing community archaeology with a group that has tried to yes, that has gone to other places mm -hmm. and that's not happening that's right they then they start to oh, notice yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, the words don't necessarily matter but the the action, the action practice matters. yeah so. they get makes it. a difference mm -hmm. um i guess this is a little more immediate question um or group of questions you know why why is community archaeology important who do we who do we need to convince of this importance why them? I would say in this day and age, um, commu community archaeology is important, and it kind of people have. It, it goes back to I guess the discussion when we very first met with the plenary. People have varying interests, and you want to serve your community, you want to serve your public, you want to make sure that the things and the questions that people have around um, sites and, and information that they want to learn because they're learning. Um, the why is it important or who do we need to convince it's important? It's everybody. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think at the end of the day, whether that's the legislation, whether it's, um, you know, just the neighbor next to the site, if it's, you know, kids, I feel like it's important to kind of express that this is our history. And without it, you know, it's kind of that old, you're doomed to repeat it if you don't know it. But with us, to some extent, it's you're doomed to lose it. <laughs> And I'm um, thinking about how we're constantly doing development and how we're constantly changing and we'll easily kind of, you know, destroy a landscape to put something else that's aesthetically beautiful or pretty, but without that knowledge of why that landscape is important, what does it mean to a certain group of people, um, how might this impact this group of people by you doing this, um, I think it's also important. When I started with the National Park Service, a lot of, I was, you know, digging in the field and, and kind of on the front line, as they call it, for, for dealing with the public. We just had people who came up to us and were interested at the fence. And sometimes it was hard because you couldn't get the work done that you wanted to do, but I always took it that um, talking to the, to the public was actually incredibly important because they were the ones who were actually paying for that mm -hmm. service. And therefore, they deserve to have um, an understanding of what's, what's going on and, and, and the insight into the process. And I, I don't think that's exclusive to sort of governmental work. I think it's also true in, in academic situations. I think it's also true for CRM. CRM is a little more difficult because of time involved and do you have time to, to be able to interact with public. Um, but it's certainly true also even now as I enter into the nonprofit world, um, I, you know, we're seeking out people to engage and to join us in progressing and in, in furthering research. So I need to share that message with everybody I can. Um, and, and, and in saying share the message, what I really want to do is an extend an invitation for dialogue, for conversation. Let's talk about this together. What, why, this is what I think is important. What do you see? Where can we change? What would you be interested in future? Those sorts of things. And it, it just all sort of leads us down into the community. <coughs> well, that's what this really fabulous um, <laughs> piece of paper right here. So uh, would you like to talk about it actually? I'd love to. <laughs> I think we're 
fantastic collaboration. <laughs> People are out there. We just we just need to know if you figure out the best ways to to get them to to us and to our projects. Well, yes, I think so. Too. <laughs> so thank you. Um, so I, I do education outreach for uh, the Society for American Archaeology, and most of you know the Harris Poll um, that we did about 20 years ago. It was a collaborative effort from a lot of different archaeological organizations that um, surveyed Americans' perceptions of archaeology. And for the past 20 years, that has kind of set the tone for um, what does the American public know about archaeology? What do we need to do better? Where do we need to focus? Um, but that was also 20 years ago, and the internet exists now, and, and <laughs> knowledge production and where people get information and, and how we communicate has changed, and so we can't really use that data anymore. So we um, did a new poll, it's done by Ipsos now, um, and it, it told us a lot of the similar things, um, but it, it's, so we kind of split it into two different, um, categories, the, the highlights of it, um, and yes, please do. Um, and the full report by Ipsos is, is also on the SA website, and I'm hoping to eventually get um, all of the data up onto our member center so that, you know, we're archaeologists, we want to play with the cross tabs, so like, you know, I want all of that to be on there. Um, but it's split into two, what I thought were really important sections, and the first is, um, information that we can take to legislators, and you brought that up too, Alex, and so you know, that I think is one of the most important audiences that we can reach. Um, and the data showed that Americans really care about protecting American heritage, and they, they have an expectation that their government is going to do that. Um, and so they want more legislation, they want greater funding for archeological projects. And so when you can take that data to a legislator and say this is what your public wants, um, and you can take community archaeology projects that are within their district and say, you know, your constituents are, you know, learning about this, they're involved in this project, and this is what they care about. That makes a big difference. <coughs> so at SAA, we're trying to, you know, convince legislators to be part of the historic preservation caucuses to, you know, vote in ways on certain bills that will protect archaeology. Um, so that, that is really important. And then the other side of it has, um, you know, it, it kind of gauges where Americans are with their knowledge about archaeology um, and where they're getting that information from so that we can uh, tailor our outreach efforts to meet people where they are. Um, and so that kind of gives us more information of where we need to head going into the future. And I'm hoping that it won't be another 20 years before we do another one. So you know, maybe we can keep this going every few years so that we have that longitudinal data and kind of can keep checking on how we're doing, whether or not we're making an impact on what people know about archaeology and, um, and, and what they want from these kinds of community-based uh, projects. Um, so since I'm, I'm sort of talking a lot right now, I'm going to keep going for a little bit. But, uh, <laughs> um, so legislation, when we're talking about you know, who do we need to convince about the, the importance of archaeology, legislators was one, but um, thinking about our outreach efforts, you know, children obviously are another one, um, like a key audience for me at least, because adults tend to be pretty set in their ways, and, and, and kids are squishy. Like they, they are just forming their values, and um, if we can instill that sense of stewardship in them early, that's how we can start moving this data even more toward having a greater knowledge of archaeology and, and um, having that importance solidified in them. Um, and then also I would say um, like historically underrepresented groups. Um, so that's kind of another key audience for me. Um, and since I'm based in DC, all three of those groups are ones that, that I am kind of positioned to have uh, you know, access to. I think I've said all the things that I can <laughs> say. <Well, laughs> I want to build off of something you said, but jump in if, if it reminds you. Um, so um, speaking right now as president of the Council of Virginia Archaeologists, which is the professional organization in Virginia, um, established in 1975, one of the things that we did sort of 
in your comment about reaching out to legislators in the past um, two years, we had a volume on the Archaeology of Virginia, an edited volume published. Um, you can get it off of Amazon. It's like, you know, you can sort of uh, print it that way. But we ordered a bunch of extras to send to the governor of Virginia, to all of our de state delegates, to local um, government officials, too, as a way to uh, have an opportunity to write a letter about archaeology and about our organization. Um, and, and also give them, you know, a little something to remind them maybe when they're in their next meeting and they're looking at their bookshelf, you know, they'll mm -hmm. see the archaeology of, um, the historical archaeology of Virginia volume kind of pop up. Um, we'll do the same thing when the prehistoric volume comes together in the next year. And so um, it's thinking of those ways that you wouldn't, it, not just site interactions, right, but other kinds of interactions that um, are out there to remind folks that archaeology is important. Um, and then, and then to build off, you know, I, I have the same kinds of groups that I think are important that archaeology um, uh, speak to, and um, of course, uh, children is is one. And so, um, in Alexandria, the students who go to Alexandria City Public Schools and our private schools will grow up thinking that archaeology is part of gov of local government. They'll just grow up thinking that. Archaeology is part of development in Alexandria. They'll grow up thinking that um, historic preservation is a core value of their community. And I think that that's, that to me was really solidified in, um, there was an article in the New York Times about these ship discoveries. And the article ended <coughs> speaking to an eight-year-old girl and she said, um, you know, in, in most areas, um, you know, peop, archaeologists in their community dig up rocks, but in Alexandria, they dig up ships, you know, and so it's kind of her way of saying, like, I'm proud of my community. <laughs> we dug up some ships, and, and, it's, and so actually we, we, uh, we talked to her dad. She came in to sign a copy of the article because it was really a way of, you know, like honoring her perspective and kind of um, bringing students in. Um, and, I, and I also think that, you know, obviously we need to speak to, you know, the, the change makers, the policy makers and folks about the importance of archaeology, but not to forget that grassroots base. And so we, you know, we have a friends group that's associated with um, Alexandria Archaeology, um, a 501c3, and most of their fundraising efforts are, are at like the $5 level. I mean, we're talking about just marching in the George Washington birthday parade as a way to remind all the citizens that come out to that parade, you know, that archaeology is part of the community. And, and so, it's, so I think it's, you know, definitely want to spend some time on, um, on folks that, you know, can make policy decisions, but also garnering that grassroots support um, has been helpful to the success of our program over the years. I love the idea that you guys gave all the legislators a book. Yeah. Um, we don't have quite that much money in Maryland, um, but what we do um, there is, and this is something that all of you guys could do in your state, because I think most states produce Archaeology Month posters. So every legislator gets a copy of the Archaeology Month poster, and we've started recently making refrigerator magnets as well, and those, those go over really well, too. So that's something relatively inexpensive that you could do to get that idea about archaeology being important out in front of your elected officials. I actually just want to add a little bit of uh, something that Eleanor said. Um, this is actually the, the theme that I keep, I've been going to a lot of the public archaeology forums this year, and the theme that keeps kind of popping up is we, we may not be able to convince the, you know, the adults or the, the policymakers right now of, you know, the importance of archaeology or why, why we need to start doing certain things to preserve our cultural heritage. Um, but, you know, working with children, we, is, is, it, we need to play the long game. Where, 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 what it comes down to, as opposed to we need to fix everything right now. I think we need to, we need to take, take a step back and say, all right, well, maybe it's not going to work mm -hmm. this generation, but if we can get the next one. <laughs> but I think, it's, I think it's yes and, right? Okay. It's, yeah. 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 Again, yeah. You know, it's, it's playing the long game and playing the short game um, and doing grassroots and working with the people at the top and all that. I have a question, which is, um, as our country becomes increasingly politically divided, uh, how do we deal with that in public archaeology? I'm thinking of a couple of years ago, um, my dad and I took my great uncle to Mount Vernon. Uh, at the time, he was 96, I think. And uh, he's a staunch Republican. Um, 
very proud to be from the most Republican county in America. Um, and it, it was sort of a tense relationship that my dad and I as pro more progressive people have with him, had with him. And, but we thought it would be like, nice to go to Mount Vernon since we all like history. You know, like, OK, this is going to be a bonding thing. And he said a lot of really um, racist things about how the exhibits about enslaved people's lives were um, sullying the memory of this great man. And of course, I was much more interested in the enslaved people's lives yeah. than I am in George Washington. So like, even just within my family, I can see this like difference in interests and values. Even, and this is like three generations of a family where we do care, or where, we're, where we all vote, where we all participate in political campaigns, where we all care about history, and yet there's this, like, he was offended by the exhibits and I was offended by his statements about the exhibits. <laughs> and was, you know, so like how, in an increasingly politically separated time, do you all go about doing programming and outreach to this public? What I want to point out to you is, it, is you actually answered it without even realizing it. The fact that you went to the exhibition and it had everybody's views uh -huh. right. equally mm. represented is the answer right there. Mm. We, we, we do what we've always done. We always give a balanced you know, <coughs> interpretation of what the site is, what our history is, and then we let you pick and choose what you want to gravitate to and focus on. But just in what you said, we're doing our job. Mm -hmm. I mean, in, in our, the sites, the, the archaeologists that are out here, we're making sure that we're covering all of our constituents and we're covering everybody's interests. And that's mm -hmm. the only thing we can do. Mm -hmm. I was just like, because everybody has that uncle. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, this has kind of come up. I mean, is it our, we're not, we're not, our job really is not to sort of <coughs> give a story that makes everybody happy and, and everything mm -hmm. fine. Okay. Uh, our job is maybe more to provoke or to begin conversation, and sometimes those conversations are hard. Yeah. And, um, and so I, I think in a way, you're right, exactly, going to that place provided an opportunity to address something that maybe you don't want to deal with at the moment, but the reality is it's there, mm -hmm. and it's something that perhaps it might be better with sunlight on it mm -hmm. than you know just tamping it down going, well, let's just all watch a movie, we can look ahead and, and not not pay attention right. to each other as much. And so and I was, this is a big thing at Montpelier, right? Because mm -hmm. we just released it a year and a half ago now, we released a new exhibition called Mere Distinction of Color that was done collaboratively with the descendant community and, um, you know, I think really pulls no punches. I mean, there's, there's conversations and exhibition components. Our thing is the Constitution, and James Madison being the father of it, right? So that's kind of our, our, our big, big picture institutional um, mission um, is focusing on teaching people about that and we have a component of this exhibit where the Constitution <laughs> is laid out on a table and you push little buttons and it highlights the components of the Constitution that protect the institution of slavery right and then you learn about how that thing that doesn't say anything about slavery actually is all about slavery right mm -hmm. and and it is also it's thinking you know about for every person that comes into that exhibit and it makes them upset well they're first of all they're thinking about it Right, like if that it's a touch point. They've they've seen that that thing. It's in their brain now, and um, and it can't be out of their brain. They might not like that it's in their brain, but it's there, <laughs> yeah. right? And so there's that. But there's also for every person that that has that reaction, there's someone else who comes into that exhibit and says, "Oh my God, I'm I'm being represented here," right? And and or right where all of a sudden their story is there where they weren't expecting to come to a presidential home. And see that story, right? Um, and represent it in ways that is the story that they want to be seeing because we did the work with the community to make sure that story is being told. So, so in some ways, right, the the answer is do the work because everyone's going to be exposed to it. But then also, I think sometimes it's like we want to get we want to get rid of the the people who are reacting, not get rid of them, but but we want to eliminate <laughs> that kind of thinking, right? Um, but at the same time, there's elevating. The you know and, and people who are thinking differently or who don't see themselves as represented, and making sure that our exhibitions and our public art gallery is elevating their voices. Mm -hmm. So that may not necessarily mean that it's going to go like this, mm -hmm. but at least it means it's going to go like this, <laughs> right? Or like this, I guess, would be mm -hmm. a better way to do it. So, yeah. 
Well, and I'll just add, um, I was with Mount Vernon for 15 years before I came to the city, and for as many of those comments as we heard and, and are still discussed even after the slavery exhibit is open, there's an, an, a lot of balance of comments that say Mount Vernon didn't go far enough. Mount Vernon is not going far enough telling the story of the enslaved community. So, um, you know, it's, yeah. it's sort of hard. It, you, you're not going to please everybody, but you're definitely going to start some conversations. <laughs> Well, and these are hard conversations, mm -hmm. difficult conversations to have. So, Terry, I wonder, are there um, employees or docents or something that are, you know, staffing this exhibit um, that interact with visitors with these questions? And if so, are they uh, trained in, in mm -hmm. how to deal with potential hostility or di difficult subjects? Yes, uh, we the our guide staff does mm -hmm. goes through goes through trainings and things like that. Um, it is it is a self guided exhibition. Mm -hmm. Um, but there is always a member of our guide staff present so that if people do have questions or concerns, they can, um, they can go, to, go to somebody and have their question, um, answer those questions. When we do our week-long public programs, which are archaeology-focused programs, um, that's a little bit more hands-on. Um, so when we take them through the Mirror Distinction of Color exhibition, they have, they, they have to obviously have a much bigger context because they've been, we've been working with them and building trust and, and that kind of thing. Um, and so that is... Uh, when we go through that process with them, you know, we're it's a smaller group, and uh, and so it's it's uh, yeah, it's a bit we're, we're there to, to answer those questions specifically. Um, it's mere distinction is often experienced by visitors after they've done the house tour, um, and uh, and the house tour as well incorporates you know we are we are talking about Madison, we are talking about Dolly, and we are talking about the enslaved community through that um, through that tour. So and it's. It is focused on this idea about you know learning about the Constitution and how that's playing out. And this stuff. So so yes, I guess that, that would have been the shorter answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I agree that you know sometimes the conversation can be the goal. Um, so when I when I worked for Archaeology Indianapolis, I was working in um, across the bay on the eastern shore um, in a town called Easton, Maryland, and um, the town is extremely <coughs> segregated still. And so um, when we were working on our project and, and a lot of our research questions um, were coming from the community and talking to descendants <coughs> on what, what they wanted to get out of the archeology span project, um, what stuck with me is, is one woman said, I, I want us to have a conversation about race. Like that, that was the goal. And she said, I, I don't want to tiptoe around it anymore in this town. Like everybody knows the, the black neighborhood and the white neighborhood and everyone knows where that line is and it is a distinct line. Um, but nobody talked about it, um, at least in any kind of productive way. And so she said, I'm so sick of tiptoeing around it. So can we just create a platform where we can have that frank conversation? And it was hard, and we didn't always succeed, but it, it started that conversation. Um, so sometimes that can just be the goal of the project, is, is starting that conversation. We're actually transitioning our the way we give guided tours and mm -hmm. things like that at Montpelier to emphasize conversation. Oh. Um, so we've been working with Sites of Conscience, which is a membership mm -hmm. organization, um, mm -hmm. to do what's called dialogical something or other so it's but it's 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 training and how to how to give a tour that is not just the top down right mm -hmm. it that it's actually you know uh, building on people's personal experience and to get to a place where you can build trust and people feel like they're able to share their opinions and make connections to the topic um, and then also be challenged because that's what we want as you were saying we want people to leave I don't necessarily want people to come to Montpelier and figure out race and racism and feel like we've solved it and like yep it was in the constitution I, don't, I know exactly how to go fix it but i want them to come and feel challenged yeah. and someday some like even leave with more questions than they came about you know wrestling with the fact that our nation is built on that contra contradiction of whatever right and and uh and so yeah and, and conversations are the things that are going to bring that bring that about so and I think using the material culture is good for that. I mean, it, a lot of times 
something as simple as like a plate and start a larger conversation. Um, it's one of those things, we have a training with teachers and I go through a whole section where we talk about interpretation and I just put down a simple object and I'm like, now, how are you gonna talk to your students about this? What comes up with this? And then we really start talking about gender. How do you discuss gender? How do we talk about ethnicity? How do we talk about class? Um, how do we talk about how people identify? And you know, it's a, it's a pink toothbrush. Who does it belong to? And everybody's like, oh, well, mom. What if the store only had blue, I mean, pink <laughs> toothbrushes, there were no blue, and it was on sale? Who does it belong to? Then it's like, oh, well, well wait a minute. Now, you know, now let's have this whole conversation or all these other things that come into play. And I think that is what makes archaeology awesome that we can have these around the simplest things, it will start a conversation and that conversation will be deeper and it'll really get people to challenge their thoughts, their notions, and how we're socialized and raised. Just to kind of add on to this, like, like you were saying, we're, we're in a highly politicized environment right now, but history has always been highly politicized. Uh, the control of the story has always been a major political issue. And the fact that we are, you know, in, in archaeology, we have this. We have the benefit of being able to move away from the documentary record and being able to say, well, yeah, sure, it says that, but look at the stuff that we found that, you know, contradicts that, and we can start these conversations. So maybe we should be leaning, leaning into the politicization of, of, of history of cultural heritage. So, yeah, I noticed that this building up on what you were saying, Tom. So Americans think archaeology is important to 73% say our nation. Um, I think a lot about, you know, how history contributes to I, like feelings of national identity, and especially this ties into what everybody's been mentioning about, you know, a politics today. So much of it comes down to nationalism and, and for, you know, our shared identity as a nation, it's about pride in, in our history. So I'd, I'd like you, you know, to, to hear what you have to say about, um, you know, how can we use archaeology to reach to these different constituencies, different publics about, you know, being proud of our history when, you know, a lot of the history is things that I, I don't feel proud about. How do we balance the education component with the component um, of building a more constructive understanding of our history and how it shapes our identities today. <laughs> I mean, I'll throw. I mean, I think it just gonna about all. All you can do is give the whole story. You know, I think, and, and so many of us. I mean, I think back to when I was a kid, and you know, in school, and you know, the the little bits that you learn, and you know, the elementary textbooks on history is you know, generally incorrect and very, you know, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant focused dudes, you know, and so there, that's certainly not the whole story. And I think what we can do is present that whole story, you know, and that there's, you're right, there's things to be proud of, but there's also things to not be proud of, you know, and, and I think, uh, I think that if we present the whole story, then that gets that information out there. And there's lots of different ways to do that. But I also think that the not so great things also stop you from doing the not so great things again. I think when you paint a picture of, we've always been this great, wonderful place all this time, we've never done, then what happens is you kind of leave the door open that people don't see clues and markers when we start going down a dark path again. And most of it is because we just aren't taught about all of it. You know, we had concentration camps. Mm -hmm. I have students all the time like, wait, there were concentration camps saying it? Yes. So what stops us from doing this again is by educating and by teaching people this is, this is what it is. So I definitely think there is something to be proud of. You know, we all love where we're from. We all have, you know, that pride. But I also think it's important <coughs> to make sure that we let you know this also is what we did. Mm -hmm. We would like never to repeat this again, never to do this again, because it is something that we are ashamed of as you know, a collective group of people that we've you know, done whatever, or ostracized a particular group, and look at all the all wonderful things they've contributed you know, to make us the nation that we are. Yeah, the next slide real quick, because we're actually kind of building into this a little bit. Um, but you know, what, what, what gets the conversation started? What, what, what types of events or sites draw the biggest crowds? What about those events or sites appeal to the public? What parts of archaeology seem to, people seem to care about the most? 
and how can that translate to those popular subjects? And I think we can kind of build a little bit on what we're talking about, where how, how do we take these, you know, big big conversations about you know, Mount Vernon or Montpelier or you know, ships on the waterfront, and how do we how do we start talking about potentially more politicized conversations or, or you know, conversations that are productive um, regarding our history? Well, we're general. ASCC is more of a general archaeology. Our biggest draw is the festival. Um, <laughs> hands down, um, we remix what you think of, of a science public day, because that didn't really work. No one wants to come and learn. <laughs> I'm just going to be honest. Uh, <laughs> that's not exciting. But we literally took it, and we have a DJ. So there's music being playing. We have food trucks. Um, face and, painting. Right, yeah. face painting. Um, and then we give a mandate to every archaeology organization. It is open to everybody in the Mid-Atlantic. We do send out invites like, go hang out in the week. Um, but we say, look, we want you at your booth to have something for kids and something for adults. Um, make it interesting. Try and do hands-on. This way, we're teaching you about something. We're not just teaching about one particular region. We're teaching you about everywhere. Everybody has their own specializations. Um, and this is our way of getting you quietly involved without you really thinking we got you. It's like the aha. And not only did we get you, no matter where you're coming from, hey, look, there's archaeology. Oh, you're where? Yeah, that organization over there. Well, oh, by the way, there's an online thing. So we find all these different ways to get folks to draw them in. But it's through the fun aspect. It's like, oh, it's a free festival. We have lots of parents who love coming. And like the response that we've gotten back this will be our seventh year, is I like the fact that it's something I can do with my kids and I can get something out of it. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like you're quietly babysitting a little bit, <laughs> and now I can actually learn something too at the same time. So this is kind of how we gain, but it also, we don't censor what topics any of the organizations. So no matter, if you want a poster, we have CRM firms that put up posters about sites that they've done. You can do this, and we can start having these conversations. Those conversations are had. At these tables, people will ask the question, well, what about this? I heard this was happening. And you quietly see kind of that cog and that wheel getting started about whatever that topic may be. So I think for us, that's one big draw um, that brings people, at least in our region, to archaeology. It's like, it's guaranteed, you're gonna, and it's free. This free day of science education. No, I, think, I think it's just a great event. I think it's a terrific event. Um, somebody, we were talking about this um, with, with, I was talking with an archaeologist at ASAAs, someone who's doing public archaeology in the West, and, um, you know, we were talking about that kind of event, and she looked at me, she goes, what do you, what do you think about, like, if we set up a booth at a rodeo? And I thought, that's actually a wild idea, you know, because you're, you're, it's not an archaeology-based event, so you don't have people self-selecting for it. But you're instead, you're also given an opportunity. And, you know, who knows? Maybe, maybe no one wants to stop by that table. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, hopefully there'll be some some engagement through mm -hmm. that. But, but I thought that was kind of a terrific idea. I also thought it was kind of a brave idea on their part too. So I, I kind of, you know, I tried to do. I tried to express how, how kind of a neat idea I think it was. And I and I I don't know if I'll ever hear back as to whether they did it and how it worked. But I thought it was intriguing and it was provocative in a way of of really poking us to say, well. Can we reach out even further? Um, your events are, 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 you know, are awesome. Um, are there other places that we can also plug into um, that we can get the people who aren't necessarily seeking archaeology already? That's something that so Bernard Means in Richmond has talked right. about that before, and so he, you know, um, goes to maker conventions and does his three D printing thing, and mm -hmm. you know, comic book conventions, like things that we wouldn't normally think of. Um, but you know, maybe there's an audience there for <coughs> similarly nerd things. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're nerdy about this. Come be nerdy about this. Yeah. <laughs> um, in, oh, I'm sorry. No, that's. I was just saying in Florida, in Pensacola, my little hometown, we have actually quite a large um, Pensacon. It's like Comic Con, but it's mm -hmm. on Pensacola scale. We've been presenting there for the last five years. Right. And they mm -hmm. love it, you know. So I mean, yeah, it's things like that. You know, any, anything, any kind of hook. You know, like that, you can go to, and we've been getting great response. Can we, oh, I'm sorry, I don't mean to. Well, I was, what about places where genealogists hang out, either physically or online? Because, uh, you know, there's so many Americans, mm -hmm. like millions, who do um, genealogical mm -hmm. research, 
And so something that co would connect uh, genealogical records with you know, nas national register sites or archaeological sites or, or ongoing studies mm -hmm. to sort of alert people who are doing family history that hang on, there are, there are these other scholars that have, that have been working on places associated mm -hmm. with your family's history. Yeah. So, yeah. so I'm working. I'm sorry. I'm working for the Germana Foundation, and actually, they are, were essentially an ethno, uh, a genealogical society that's about 60 years old now. Mm -hmm. They acquired stewardship over a, a significant site in the state of Virginia, mm -hmm. and um, ha they hired me. And now they're kind of shifting, um, whereas their their concentration was largely on sort of that descendant community. Now it's a site and a descendant community that connects. Um, and that's actually really a fascinating um, experiment for me. Um, working, you know, in a descendant community in this way, this is different than when I've worked with descendant communities elsewhere. Um, but it's, it's kind of fascinating. At the same time, sometimes we speak very different languages. I get really focused on talking about this place. And they're thinking about, well, my family moved through here and on west, and now they live in Oregon, you know. Um, it's almost like they're they're following the river and I'm busy on the shore staring at a rock. <laughs> but when we have a dialogue, when we have conversation around that, it actually ends up um, provoking both of us. I start thinking about things in a different way. I start to realize that my community is a whole lot bigger than just in my immediate area. And they start thinking about that place as differently. When they go out there and, and stand there, um, uh, there's a lot of emotion tied to that and connected with that. And if we can give them objects, tangibles, um, they get, they, you know, that's a really, really solid connection, emotional connection. No, I was just gonna say, um, uh, one of the most meaningful experiences I've had at Alexandria was because of a genealogical connection, someone doing research on their family stumbled across our um, online bibliography. So all contract reports, all Alexandria archeology span reports are up online and searchable. And so they picked up on a name, um, and this person was the descendant of a Revolutionary War hero, and there had been some archaeology that had happened, not right up on the main house, but a little bit further away. Um, and this, this particular person was interested not just in his genealogy to this Revolutionary War hero, who was a friend of George Washington, but also in the fact that his family owned enslaved people, you know, and, and so he wanted to learn more about that. And you know, archaeology reports are a little dense. <laughs> and so he emailed us to talk about the, uh, what, what was actually found at the site, how did it relate to the enslaved community, and um, he had gone to the, um, I'm, I'm not going to remember the right name, but it's like the coming to the table group where dis, uh, descendants of um, enslaved people and of um, slave owners come to get, come around a table to have conversations. And so he had come to one of those events in Virginia and, and said, I'm, I'm going to be close. Can I stop by Alexandria and maybe you could talk a little bit about the report and what was found. And so we pulled the, um, th there was a, probably the remains of at least one subfloor pit, you know, and, and other material in the plaza and relating to um, kind of an outlying quarter. And, um, and so for him to see that material and to engage with the extensive history that had been done by the contracting company for this site, um, you know, he, he, was, he was very moved and he's actually come back, that he came back the next year to visit the artifacts again and to kind of talk about them. So. Um, you know, I, I would just say you never know when, you, you know, genealogists are avid Googlers and yeah. you never know when that connection is going to come. And I was glad that we had the opportunity to, to facilitate that. So. I think Matt's going to tell us a story. Well, I was going to ask, but maybe you could answer it. Yeah. So, I, but have any of you all, um, I love that, that story, Eleanor, and it, was, it made me think, is there, um, do you all know of anybody that has done that intentionally, like made the archaeology available? for people who are, have connections with that space to come and visit and uh, be a way to touch their ancestors, yeah. to be in connection. I don't know if anybody, because that happens accidentally, you have to right. anybody intentionally. But. That's what we're working towards. <laughs> oh, that's right, okay. Yeah. We're building that. We're, we've got a new building going up and we're hoping to make that a place where, but not just, we also want to find other descendant communities. The, the Germans who moved in there and lived for a short duration, about 12 years, picked up and moved west. Well, an enslaved labor force followed behind it, and we don't know much about that, but is that another descendant community that we can also tap into and learn more about and 
help make connections as well. At Jefferson Patterson Park and Museum, um, we have an archaeological site that's back behind the Mac Lab that uh, is a above ground foundation and we started doing some oral history with the people uh, that lived on the park and we found out that it was a postbellum uh, African American tenant farmer site and we made contact with the family and they came out and helped us excavate the site. Um, now we've got an interpretation <coughs> of the site as part of our trails and every year the family comes back and has a family reunion at the park and they go and visit the site. Mm -hmm. So. Um, well, and I mean, Matt, you know, you <laughs> don't work. <laughs> but you know, at Montpelier, we have a number of families that we've worked with extensively. The Gilmore family being the one of the primary ones, and that's actually work that started in the same time that Montpelier was going through the restoration process in the early 2000s of the main house. Uh, Rebecca Gilmore Coleman came and knocked on the door and said, I see that you're taking care of this house. What are you doing about my family's house? It's across the street. and the foundation decided that they'd do them both at the same time. <laughs> so um, so we have this, you know, and, and so that's been an integral part working with the Gilmores and then that's expanded to working with a bigger and bigger descendant community um, and we have a very broad definition of what it means to be a descendant. We decided that, you know, white people at Montpelier had spent enough time defining who belongs in what African American family. Um, so it's, you feel a connection to the space um, and you want to be a part of the conversation, um, we consider you part of the, the, the Senate community. Um, and, and so that's been, you know, and, and that's, that's grown to, they participate in excavations, they help do excavations on, on their ancestral home. Um, we've had uh, with the early family that came and um, that was through genealogy that they kind of found us and they had essentially a family reunion that was involved a week long excavation and, and for them it really it added depth to the, the genealogical work that they had that they were doing because they were spent so much time with the names right but this added doing the archaeology added the lived experience and and the lived experience beyond what you might read in the textbooks right if you if, if that's even in the textbooks <laughs> um, and and to touch the objects that they you know Anything you pull out of Montpelier, if you pull it out of the ground, the last person to have touched it is probably an enslaved African American. Whether they own that object or not, doesn't matter. They, they were thrown in the trash wave. So, um, so they knew that they were touching those objects that belonged to their, um, to their ancestors. So it added that depth and weight and, um, to, to the, the search that they've been doing for their, for their ancestors. And I think that, that's what adds this social justice component to, to, to the work that that public art and community archaeology does, right? Is it's 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 uh, it's helping people find, particularly when you're working with um, descendants of the enslaved community, it's helping people discover those histories that have been ripped away from them, um, you know, through the through the process of enslavement. And so, so being able to work with them so that they can then rediscover and be a part of that discovery, you know, that's and that's what starts making this really a, almost a social justice like activity. Um, which I think is um, you know, super powerful and, and, and really important and uh, what, can, what can come from these kind of engaged um, projects. One participant compared, she said that she had been plan trying, trying to plan a trip to Africa to connect with her ancestors. She felt coming to Montpelier, you know, you know, being in the archaeology, felt like that was the equivalent of it. She's, I think she's going in a couple of years. She'll tell us what it was. <laughs> <laughs> So I have a, a question, I guess, for the group about a slightly different scenario. We talked, if we think about the conversation that started with the last slide, we started with nationalism and kind of a mm. national connection, um, a, a connection through nationalism to some of these sites. And then with this slide and the conversation, we've, we've almost gone to a, the other end of the spectrum to descendant families um, and, a, and a notion of connection to place in the past. I work in a community where there is a very strong bifurcation between a group, a population that is seen as having lived there longer and therefore has a legitimate claim to that descendancy and therefore owns history. And a more recent immigrant population that is seen as having no connection 
to that place. In spite of the fact that those recent immigrants are primarily from Mexico and Central America, and the town we're talking about has the name of the Mexican era land grant that it was built on. Um, so this, this is a very much a false past and a false association of who owns and who doesn't own history. But we've found that it creates a very interesting dynamic when you're trying to foster um, awareness of, never mind just archaeology, but even history, the past with a capital P in this area, um, and some really heated contests over, over who has the authority to speak for the past. And I'm wondering if we're talking about events and interpretation and things like that, <clears throat> what do you do in not just an increasingly nationalist US, but an increasingly diasporic U.S., where the people who live locally or live even regionally may not feel any connection. So you either have to pitch it as science, right? Mm. Hey, come do science with us. It's cool. You know, we got chips, not rocks. Um, <laughs> right? <laughs> or, or it's your family. You know, where? what if that neither of those really work? Is anybody dealing with that kind so, of situation? I have, but again, I work with kids. <laughs> so yeah. It, yeah. It's a different dynamic. It's a very different dynamic. Um, right. And it was a, working with a group of kids where, and it's a completely different country on top of that, so it's not even within the U.S., mm -hmm. um, that you have a lot of folks, that there's this national identity of what the country's story was. Right. and what's always pushed and what's romanticized and what everybody thought. And then you have everybody else. Yeah. And so what I did was when I created my presentation, my kind of heritage interpretation, anti-looting, everything else that went into that working with the kids, I had a bit of everybody in there. Yeah. And the thing is, is when everybody can see in the story themselves, mm -hmm. it one, educates people about the people who never get talked about, but also mm -hmm. makes the people who feel like they're neglected added back in. And so for me, it was a way of doing it on a younger level, that you start to kind of foster that mutual respect. And you see it's coming from somebody who, you know, and kids look at all of us as adults as like teachers and great, wonderful know-alls. So if it's coming from this authority that all of you are equally important, look at all the cool things that this person did and contributed and also and they came during this time and this is what's going on, that builds and that kind of goes. So for me, it was, I knew coming in there was already this contested kind of issue. Mm -hmm. I knew there was also issues with uh, immigrants and everything else that people didn't want to give them credit for. And the reality is when the country was established, the borders were a lot wider and everybody actually all belonged and they're descendants of the same groups. Yes. It's kind of stupid, but I'm well, going to recognize it. That but, line's right, stuff, right? Yeah. Right? but for me, the way to combat that is don't deal with adults. I mean, they just need to. <laughs> <laughs> start the foundation of mutual respect if I for in respect for heritage for history for place for space if I start that now it grows and it kind of goes through and every every time I would go back even though it's a different group of kids right in that longer lecture that I did I did make it a point because I didn't want any one child to feel like they were left out or that their story um, wasn't as important as somebody else's because of what nationalistically right. they were pushing right. and again with the adults. So I don't know. <laughs> it's a little harder with adults. It's much harder with adults. Yeah, I was just thinking that about kids too. I went to a high school that is now a like private day school, but it's descended, it claims to be, have been founded in 1742 because the Moravian Germans of Pennsylvania started a one-room schoolhouse in 1742 that over the centuries turned into my high school and so we did a lot of like Moravian history and like they're the separatist group they had all kinds of unusual traditions and there were like bell choirs in my high school and tr it was a trombone choir because the Moravians were into trombone choirs like it, it became part of the culture of the high school and that we were descended from the Moravians and yet like most of us were, were not even members of the Moravian church there were a whole lot of like children of doctors from India and Pakistan who had uh, come to the U.S. and yet my South Asian friends felt a connection with 
the Moravians too, because we go to the same school that the kids went to. And so I think there's like, even if you can connect kids to the stories of kids in that place, they're like, I'm a kid in this place, that person was a kid in this place. And then the connection happens whether or not like, like you can create a fault, uh, I mean not false, but like a, a sense of, of that descendants without actual genealogical descendants. So on some level, all of us are immigrants to some place or the other um, here in the United States, right? I mean, my family came over in the 17th century. Um, so could you portray this as every group has its part to play along the lines in creating the story of place? Well, in California, especially in this part of California, you have to be a little careful about that because okay. I have too many Miwok and Pomo friends who don't consider themselves right. well, to be immigrants. Right, right. And they're, right, they're a yeah, significant right. part of the population. But mm -hmm. um, it's been more, you, you can do that, but it only goes so far because there, that in and of itself builds in this yardstick of older versus newer. Mm -hmm. And it's you're right, it's the kids and the sort of identity that they can create to place has worked, but with adults, it's been a bit more challenging. Mm -hmm. To be continued, I'll check, yeah. I'll, I'll let you know. <laughs> I mean, with adults, I think you can expect that, that there's going to be pushback and then prepare for it. When I'm talking about having those difficult conversations, like being prepared to have a respectful dialogue um, without necessarily expecting to change someone's mind because you right. probably right. won't. It, it um, goes back to the earlier conversation mm -hmm. with the uncle in right. some ways. Mm -hmm. so you're not gonna, but at least yeah. you can create platform for yeah. the conversation. Yeah. And you might, not have, you might not convince them then, but it still plants a seed that, that can then build later on. Mm -hmm. um, so it, um, my number must come up when somebody Googles like particularly controversial archaeology things because <laughs> the Society for American Archaeology office is, it, it directs to me and so I get a lot of calls from people. Lucky <laughs> 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 you. It's everyone. So um, yeah, my my coworker is always very apologetic when she forwards those calls, but um, uh, it there's a very particular type of call that I get that is somebody who um, has a particular mindset that has then been challenged. Yeah. And they want mm. to convince me for some reason that they're right. Um, I, I don't know what they think is going to happen, but um, I, I spend a lot of my work day having those kinds of, of dialogues. Um, and so I don't expect to convince them and whoever originally put that information in front of them, hopefully didn't expect to convince them, but if they have that conversation enough, then they might start questioning, okay, well maybe there are other perspectives, um, and maybe if, if it continues, then their mind will change, but like I was saying, adults are already pretty. Uh, One of the things we're dealing with is that, if, if this, that because this narrative continues, more recent arrivals are told that they don't have any legitimate claim to any past there, so why should they care about that past? Right. Mm -hmm. So, and, and as the demographics of the city shift, the consequences for, again, not just archeology, span but, you know, historic preservation, even just, mm -hmm. just any notion of mm -hmm. connecting the past to the present, the chances for that go significantly down. With the past ignorance, I mean, we often, when we talk about archaeology, kind of almost say like everything is like very old. Yeah. The concept of current archaeology, yes. what a mm -hmm. current archaeology right. project might even help with this, yeah. like um, maybe doing an excavation of a very recent site within like the past, you know, ten years or something yeah. that you know maybe a group was at and they left, and kind of talking about. Um, you know, kind of flipping something and adding that in in order to give legitimacy mm -hmm. to the newer group mm -hmm. to show that as archaeologists we are recognizing this group and that, you know, there's contemporary archaeology and then there's, you know, what everybody considers new, mm -hmm. new which is archaeology of 100 plus years. Or, right. So maybe something like that. Um, and it didn't actually have to be, you know, a great ground 
to. I was just going to say, you we're know, a landscape archaeology. A mapping project. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so I'm doing it right. So I'm just going to say. And just wanted to step back a little bit where you, you started talking about um, getting the Senate community involved in their own history. Um, kind of talk about volunteers, the role of volunteers. Um, where should the distinction between professional volunteer archaeologists be drawn on active excavations? What should or shouldn't? Uh, volunteers be allowed to do, and should there be a line at all? Should, should everybody be doing it? So, uh, we don't excavate much. We do a little, um, only with our Sync Career Project, and we do allow volunteers. All of ours are students, though, um, that come out. Um, they're with us. They're they're putting in the work, they're doing, we've trained them, and I think that's like, you know, the important part. Um, in throwing this question out is, they are trained. We are mm -hmm. uh, bringing out people who have not had a lecture, haven't been taught, or anything else, and just kind of throwing them out there and be like, well, go dig, good luck, don't mess up anything. Um, <laughs> so for me, I, I think volunteers are important. Um, as far as the line, I mean, I guess professionally, we all we all know what that line is. I mean, they can't write a site report. I mean, there, there's you have to double check your notes. You have to consider all of the actual things that we need. So, to, for me, I wouldn't throw somebody who's had no experience whatsoever and hope that my notes are going to be kept every day. And I've not gone back and double checked to make sure that the artifact, you know, count in the bags and everything align. So I do think there is a certain amount of we are trained or skilled, um, we are scientists for a reason. Um, but also being careful um, not to close that door, that we aren't allowing people in um, and that experience, as long as it's informed experience. So. Let, me, let me kind of throw another wrench in the machine. Um, I mean, I, I think this is, this is something that has been talked a lot about in the public archaeology forum that's been going on, that having people come in and actually things, dig, you know, dig, a, dig a unit, screen, you know, find things, gets them more excited about it. Um, what, what, I guess, what strategies have worked best for you? Is it, is it better to pair them up with a professional or, you know, a, uh, on site or, or a more experienced volunteer? You know, uh, is it better to do a mock dig? Is it, you know, what, I mean, what, what things have, because I know, I know there's at least, you know, two programs that are up here do work with volunteers a lot. What strategies have worked for you guys to to you know get you know some decent quality of work and also help people stay involved and get their hands literally dirty? I think our I think our strategy is to broaden what an archaeology volunteer is. An archaeology volunteer is much more than an excavation partner, right? And um, in our office, we undertake some excavation, but we do a ton of historical documentary research. So right now, the vice president of our friends group comes in, comes in every Saturday to help us uh, complete the Alexandria Mutual Fire Insurance Policy data set that we're going to be putting into GIS. She's particularly interested in um, the experience of enslaved people in an urban situation, and so she does that. Uh, we have an, an, illust an artifact illustrator. Um, we have, we have a, a museum, it's essentially a community resource center that's staffed by volunteers who talk to the public when they come in about archaeology. I, I, I think part of this is, um, is, is, is reminding ourselves of all of the stages of archaeology and, and where particular interests of you know, highly trained folks, not in archaeology, but in all sorts of other facets of life, you know, what they can contribute and how their skills match what, what you're working on. And we have um, over 5,000 volunteer hours donated every year, about over 130 individual volunteers. So we've got a big, you know, a lot to manage, but um, we also have a variety of things going on. So it's not just about excavation. That's the thing that we've discovered as well. I've, like, we basically don't do our artifact photography anymore because we have three right. photographers who come in and volunteer their time and they take amazing beautiful gorgeous professional right. quality photos because they're professional photographers so um and uh and so our lab is largely i mean we have curator lab manager and 
30 volunteers that are coming in weekly. Um, some who've been with us, how long has well, been with 15 10, years? 10 years. 10 years. Yeah. Um, and, no, some no, who, sorry. Yeah, and some who, yeah. you know, started a couple weeks ago. <laughs> and and as you get to know them, you start to learn what their what their strengths are, what their interests are, and figuring out how to how to weave that into to the types of things that you're doing. You know, when the transfer this treasurer for the transfer collectors club showed up, like that was nice, <laughs> right? So she comes in every Wednesday and does transferware analysis, um, which is phenomenal because we have lots of those. Um, so so that's. There's that component, which a lot of that kind of the weekly volunteers uh, that we get are, are usually working in the lab for us and doing lab-based stuff. And then we have our week-long programming. And so that's 15 week-long expedition programs where people come and live on the property and do archeological excavations alongside of our, alongside our staff. And so that's a, that's a different kind of model. Um, and that's a, that's a, you know, we have, we've been doing these for a while now, so we have pretty clear um, format for how this works and it requires a staff that is trained and that knows how to do this work and that is passionate about it um, and and it requires um, a, a lot of time and energy to put into making it go well but they're working on real sites I, I don't think people would come I don't think it'd be interested if we just had a sandbox for them to come yeah. dig in and and we build this a, a team ethos right that they're coming and they're part of the team um, that uh, we, we call it the Montpelier family. They're part of our family. Um, and, and building that camaraderie and being very clear that they're working on a real site, that place where real people lived. Um, and, and so, you know, I don't worry about people destroying stuff. That we have lots of people supervising them and they're all terrified. They're terrified that they're good. Like by the time we finish the series of lectures in the morning, they're more, you know, they're just like tiny little scrapes. Like there's, you know, <laughs> like the vast majority of them are, are more interested in being a part of this experience and learning as much, as much as they can. But that has to do with how you frame that, frame that project and, um, and, and the, again, the passion of the people who are working with them and our staff who are working with them every day. So, um, and it's great when you had the question before that was like, what's the biggest event? And I, when you sent us the questions, I was trying to think like, what's the biggest archeology span event? Like, and you know, the, the events that we have that are property wide, Constitution Day and our Juneteenth celebration and the, the hunt races, which has nothing to do with our, <laughs> that's just a big horse race. Um, but for us, the biggest archeology span event that we've done is when we have a dinner where we invite all of our expeditioners and the hundred people show up. So, you know, and that's, so that's, that's a, because we've built this long-term constituency base of people who are committed to the department. And, you know, we, like our, our VP for advancements just about had to pick her job off the floor when these <laughs> RSVPs for this dinner kept coming in um, because these are folks who are now deeply invested in, in the program. So, um, yeah. So anyway, it's, you know, volunteers are critical in every aspect of what we do. I agree, and, and I like to thank you for saying it's team, because we're, yeah. in we're inviting them into our team, mm -hmm. and archaeology is a team effort. Yep. Mm -hmm. It absolutely is. I think we all know that. Um, but I think um, oh, I'm going to lose my point in trying to, to rally here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's also... Uh, it's, it's not without its challenges as well. I'm and sure. I think we have to sort of mean thing it. And then maybe what we also need to consider is who gets to volunteer? Who's available to volunteer? Mm -hmm. They're coming to us and, and, and oftentimes contacting us to, for that opportunity. Um, I think we should sort of problematize that a little bit and think about is there, is there other ways mm -hmm. to connect um, people to our team? as well those are all great yeah. and they oh, yeah, should absolutely. go away but i think we also can, ought to try and keep you know really work at it to say what what else can we can we do to bring people in? access is a huge issue yeah. right absolutely a so, week is a long time and you've got to take off work right you've got to come up i mean it's a it's a fee-based program it's a fee-based program right you got right. so you got to come up with a fee i mean like absolutely access is, an, is, a, is a huge issue so we are we're always thinking about other ways that we can so like with the descendant groups, that's often not the format that works well. So we work with them to come up with other 
other ways that they can come. You know, maybe it's a two day program or it's one afternoon or, you know, um, sometimes they're not interested in digging, but they're happy to tell us what they think we should be working on and helping us with interpretation and stuff like that. But yeah, access is incredibly important. And to your point, yeah. I was about to yeah. say, if we take out the digging, yeah. everything that MTC does is around by, we yeah. completely operate off of volunteers and interns, period. And I'm very clear when you come in and you express um, you want to volunteer, I literally ask, what do you care about? Because no matter what you care about, archaeology does it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, seriously. So I have people who, I had a student who came to me and was like, I love to draw. I was like, I need coloring pages. Archaeology based coloring pages. It has to be accurate. And this is, they're an archaeologist, so they know. I don't want anything that's going to perpetuate these falsehoods with the kids, but I want you know, then I need you to create a sheet where we can also do matching. It has words, and she ran with it. This was like, great, I've been trying to get my start. I want to make coloring books, so this was great for her. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I, every time I meet somebody who says, like, oh, I'm really good at this, or I'm really great at this, or, all right, well, we can create a program, or <laughs> we can do, but this is, this is how I get people to come to archaeology. So if we want to talk about like the importance of what we do, I try to literally catch you where you're at and then drag you in. <laughs> like, we do this. Um, <laughs> um, study. Right. <laughs> but I, I, I'm, I'm, and I think that's one of the great things that I am starting to see with a lot of like the nonprofits and the community organizations. We, we are really getting creative with how we're doing this. Um, and we're finding innovative ways to do this. I, events um, kind of made me think of, we did a foodie event. So we partnered with the museum. They have a great ceramic collection. We got a, a ceramic specialist to come in. It's the same one that we work with. Right. <laughs> yeah. She happens to be the mother of somebody I went to high school with. Um, <laughs> <Tiny> <laughs> <old>. <laughs> so she came in and gave a whole lecture on their collection of ceramics and the uses. And what we did was we got a food historian to come in. And we created and replicated historic recipes to match with what would go on this, you know, these dishes. So if it was a meat dish, we had meats there. If it was a vegetable, we had, and we used period recipes. We gave out the recipes and we also did period punches. Of course, everybody loves to drink, so the punch is a hit. But all of the recipes were lined out. This is not something you would think of when you think of archaeology. How am I going to get you to learn about this landscape, this food? How am I going to, you know, dishes? Who actually pays to come to hear about dishes? And they did. It was completely sold out. So it's one way of getting archaeology to come food. to the people. Yeah. It's the food. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's, it was the way of getting people to come out and rethink what they think archaeology is and how archaeology can be used. And that's what makes kind of what we do important is that by expressing to people just the fact that you like your tummy full, <laughs> you now are going to learn something that you never knew. You're going to look at dishes different for the rest of your life now thanks to this. Everywhere you go, anytime you're in a house museum, you're going to look at the collection and be like, oh, I learned that that's a such and such and this is the glass that they use for this. So. I, yeah, I think volunteers are awesome. I think utilizing their special skill sets and showing them how what you do can also be archaeological and that we aren't the only gatekeepers. You know, we, we may be the specialists, but you, without even knowing it, you know, kind of almost become a junior archaeologist in your own specialization, whether it is photography, whether it is, we can now train you what that connection is and kind of bring you here to us. And this is brilliant because how many how many people sitting in this room and you don't have to raise your hands have said God volunteers are so much work and we don't have enough staff and if you put them to something that they're already good at then you don't have to sit there and make sure that they're doing things the way you want them to be done because you're letting them run with what they're already good at and you're getting much more added value beyond what would happen if you you know just had them rehousing collections or something so I think so, that, <laughs> I was like, sort, sort of redone, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to 
Yeah, I was um, sorry. So, <laughs> sort of related to that is Oyster Pen has had great success in uh, developing volunteer programs that it, around non-disturbance recording and monitoring of sites. Mm -hmm. So the volunteers not they're not we're not expecting them to dig or do anything like that. And so we've got training programs. So we call it Heritage Monitoring Scouts, and this is training programs uh, for volunteers who want to walk along the beach and you know <laughs> look at look for archaeological sites that may be. Um, uh, threatened by erosion or sea level rise, even though we can't, well, state employees can't say that in Florida, um, and uh, uh, that sort of thing. So, uh, you know, and this is primarily on state parks, so people are in state parks anyhow, and so they're, they're walking, you know, we kind of train them is key, just like Alex said, training is key. And so we have one to three day training programs to train them what to look for and how to monitor and how to take photos and what we're looking for. We have one for sport divers to train them how to help us monitor historic shipwrecks. And that's huge. I mean, and again, it's tying into what people love. You know, here's a fun thing to go do underwater that doesn't involve killing a fish. So, you know, um, <laughs> so that appeals to a lot of people. And uh, we've got one for uh, people who are interested in cemeteries. And cemetery people are kind of like lighthouse people. They're nuts. You know, they <laughs> And so, you know, here's how to go into a historic cemetery and, you know, properly record them and that kind of thing. And so, and then that way they could go out and do it on their own. They don't necessarily require supervision. We do a lot of support programs, you know, once a month meetups or Facebook groups or, or meetings or that kind of thing to give them support. But, uh, but we've had tremendous success in that. I just wanted to build off of what you were saying about uh, you know, finding, finding the, the one way to make it less work, right, is to find the things they're passionate. But the other thing is also creating an atmosphere at the place that they're volunteering where they want to come back. Mm -hmm. And and putting that energy and time, like it's not a lot of work when people you love are coming to help you do archaeology every week. Like that's not work. That's fun. You know, it's exciting when the Babbitts come every Friday and they bring a lot of baked goods. <laughs> and it's Babbitt's Friday, you know Tom, right? I mean, it's phenomenal. It's a, it's a lot of brownies. <laughs> but, but you know they do that because they love us and we love when they come because we love them and like it, it's it is it's it's building that you know we we get all of our volunteers name tags right if you come on three of our programs you get a name tag like a, not not like a this but like a staff name tag mm -hmm. right and that's a symbol right it's saying you're part of us and and that's not work it's not work anymore it's mm -hmm. it's fun because it's just the people you like coming to see you every week right. so. Um, Um, I'm just curious for your volunteers, um, do most of you have like a dedicated day for people to come in or is it just scattered anytime? Is it mostly during the week? Is it mostly weekends? Does it, I mean, I, where I work, if I'm not out in the field at some 60 sites we're responsible for plus state property, um, We've got Tuesdays, and we've dedicated Tuesdays. We've got volunteers who've been there for 30 years helping us out. But I feel, I know that we're missing a, a, a good component of weekend people because, hey, they're working. Um, but it, it's, it's finding that balance so you're not there 60 hours a week as well. Um, so I'd be interested to know how, how your volunteer time set up are, um, if you have like any house people. So, for, well, we don't have in-house, kind of, sort of, what we fluctuate. Um, ours are everything. So we have majority of virtual. Um, we have one-day programs. We have, you want to dedicate your time to a specific program and the length that it's going. Um, I, do you want to go and work somewhere abroad? So there's a variety of options for it so that we can kind of meet everybody and where you're at. So. The fact that we have volunteers who don't live in DC, who are going work and we're skyping or calling or going back and forth to get you know work together to do what. Um, so I think having that variety definitely gives you a larger pool of people to work with. Our labs open seven days a week for most of the year, um, so we have uh, interns who staff it on the weekends. Um, so so our volunteers come in seven days a week depending on what works within their schedule and this, you know, when we're open, obviously. So, um, and that works really well. So, uh, because they get to pick, they get to choose. Wednesdays are a particularly heavy day for some reason, but um, Fridays there's brownies. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
I'm an operation of one for most of the year. So I try not to say no, but then you end up dragging yourself down, you know. It's a balancing act. Um, it's, it's really hard to um, be available for everybody and all their needs um, when you're the sole person. Now, other times of the year it works out a little bit better, but it, it's difficult and, you know, I, I think some of us need, we, I, I need to sometimes learn to protect myself a little bit and say, I really should see my family. You know, uh, and you know I can't pull that off, but but I tend to try and say, you know, here's an opportunity. I don't want to miss out. I don't want them to miss out. So I try to to work my schedule as best possible. But it's a balancing act. If you have a staff that you can have seven days a week, that awesome. I'm just we're you know we haven't figured out how to get that kind of funding in to to be able to do that sort of thing yet. Um, so this is this is a little bit for me. Um, <laughs> CRM. Uh, CRM contracts sometimes have public outreach clauses. I know um, Alex Gentry sometimes includes it. Uh, DC, I know, regularly includes it in, in PR, uh, into the scope of work. Uh, what other ways or can, can or should CRMs participate in community archaeology? <laughs> I, um, I'll, I'll offer one. Um, we, we had a public archaeology day. Or, well, Alexandria kind of put together a public archaeology day. And uh, myself and um, uh, Chelsea Cohen, who was on our uh, panel on on Thursday morning, um, uh, was our was our ship expert um, that we or ship consultant, whatever you want to call her, um, uh, helped helped us with uh, documenting um, the ships. We came out and you know opened opened up the site for for the public to come in and check it out. And you know, I mean, there was I don't remember how many people it was. It was a lot. 3,200 people came yeah. in, in the span of four hours yeah. on a Saturday in April. Yeah, and that, that was also mm -hmm. one of the days. It was the, amazing. There was a lot of press that was there that day as well. Um, and, and I mean, it was, I, I, I like doing that stuff. A lot, of, a lot of CRM folks don't really like interacting with the public. And I can tell you, I got shouted out from the street a, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it, in, in it, but it, it, it is one of those things where you kind of have to just, <clears throat> work with it because it, it makes you know it makes you realize that people care about this stuff. But but the, the amazing thing, just to build off what you said, the amazing thing is it wasn't just Thunderbird and Alexandria Archaeology. It was city police, the city communications director, like the whole city team was involved in it. And the developer. So like the vice president of development for the company was there. Um, one of the project managers was down there with Tom helping to open one of the ships and, and then pull, pull the plastic back over it and provide the water to spray it down and keep it wet. I mean, it was really, um, a, it was a true community effort. Um, and so I think that that's what was what made it so successful and what energized you know, all those people that came. So, that's very cool. so as a recipient, a little bit different, um, I will give a shout out to Stantec. Um, they're awesome. Like they actually sponsor every year our festival but they have a booth and they sit there and they have posters of all their sites and they're telling people what they do and in the different areas and the different regions. So they're very good about that as well. And it may not be kind of your traditional where they're the ones jumping out, but because there is this community opportunity to talk and let people know what they're doing and the projects they have run, every year they come out to the festival and they have a big I mean, giveaway swag and everything along with telling hey, these are the projects we worked on, these are our findings, this is what we've been doing. And you don't actually see that a lot with like the bigger companies that they come out. And so that, that is one group that I, I will kind of commend them on that. They're very committed to you know, community archaeology and actually talking to the public and letting the public know what they're doing. So. I don't know if this helps or adds to the conversation, but um, so I teach in a, a graduate program in CRM. It's, it's not a graduate program in anthropology or archeology, span it's a graduate program in CRM. And about five years ago now, we had a student who did his master's thesis doing an ethnographic study of CRM companies that were trying to do community archeology. span And he, to develop a sort of best practice, what did these people say were the ways to actually get it done, were the ways to combat to a certain extent, the culture of the business, which can mitigate against it, um, but also resistance from people like 
develop our clients sometimes if we don't want to spend the money. Um, so anyway, great thesis, came up with some really cool best practices. I can give you the information if anybody's interested. Very California based because that's where we are. And as you know, with CRM, the legal framework is so different from state to state that I'm not sure how portable this might be, but it might be interesting. The two main findings that he came up with was that it turns out CRM is now 50 some years old. And a lot of people who have been working in CRM have been working in essentially the same places. Um, I know this isn't true everywhere, but in a lot of cases you've got people who have 30 year relationships with local historical societies and you know different community organizations and so things like your festival. Um, and so they don't do community archaeology on a project by project by project basis. Sometimes you can, like with the ships, sometimes that's not practical. Um, but they do it through these alliances with other organizations to partner to do something about local, if you will, public heritage projects, public heritage programming, rather than just archaeology. They're, they're sort of <coughs> co-participants. And then the second thing that was his main finding is that while the law mandates this, there's very little in policy that actually reinforces that. So a lot of what's happening as CRM-based public community archaeology is totally grassroots. It's very under the radar. If you don't know the company that's doing it, the, the perception is it doesn't happen. But almost everyone that he dealt with had some example of, we just made it happen. So I think there's a huge interest in doing it. It's they need the help from others of us that have a little more support for, for maintaining those kinds of programs over time, because then they can drop in and out as the projects allow them. So anyway, just a thought. It, it seems to me that as archaeologists work, whether we're in CRM or we're you know, um, in a, working with government or in nonprofits, you know, I think as a community, we all maybe um, need to continue to ask for public engagement. I mean, for a CRM firm, you know, it's really hard when margins are tight to do anything that's not in your scope of work. Mm -hmm. But as a CRM firm, you could um, go to your client and try to sell them on the idea of, hey, you, here's an opportunity for you to build up some public goodwill for your, your firm or for your project. That gets easier to do when, you know, review agencies are sending the same kind of signal and maybe if the public is also you know uh, sending those same messages so it seems like you know as a community across the board if we all sort of try to ask for more public and community engagement with senior projects then that gets to be an easier sell becomes something that, that becomes expected right? but it's it's you know, right now, I mean, you know, working with, um, I think, uh, for companies working with developers, it's hard. You know, they're they're you know, they're putting every every project out to bid, and it goes to the lowest bidder. And, and you know, and if you put in anything in your in your um, your cost proposal that's not strictly required, you're going to be the one that doesn't get the job. So, you know, so that's the kind of the catch twenty two. You know, it has well, to be like all of it. I wonder, since this is also a discussion about nonprofits, right, is, is where it is not as far as what can our role be in becoming consulting parties and things like that on these projects, and, mm -hmm. and thereby making that, you know, we're a member of this community, there's going to be this excavation if we believe that there should be a public right. education component as part of the scope of work, right, and, and using our position outside of CRM to maybe infiltrate a little bit mm. and, 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 and push for it. Well, advocate. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Mm. I, I will say I've had a few CRM firms actually reach out to me for like consultation and advice on how can we do a public and give me some ideas mm. of what are possibilities um, in this project that we can have like a public component. One, because also recognizing that it is a special skill set as an archaeologist. Not all of us are good at doing public and community outreach, I mean, period. And I appreciate it when my colleagues say, oh, no, no, no. And I don't really like people. So, <laughs> <laughs> can you come in and do it? 
it's like, you're great. Like, you love doing this. You enjoy it. You're wonderful. Can you come in and do this? Or how can I do this? Or can you give me ideas for how I can do this? But I don't have to talk to people. But then the same thing is conveyed. And, but being honest about that so that we can actually come up and work with and come up with a creative way. And I've had one firm say, okay, look, we don't have any money. But what is a free way that we can come? So I have seen people try and make that effort and kind of on their side. Um, and be honest about the margins because that's a very real thing at the same time. But uh, yeah, I don't, um, I don't know. Maybe that's that's a conversation or something that should be uh, definitely pushed across. And, yeah. Tom, can I ask, were you paid for that event? Yeah, that was that was. I mean, there there was a there was a. And was that off the company? It was that off Thunderbird um, that, that footed that, or where did that come from? That's a good question. Um, I, I, they, the Wetland Study is actually pretty good about um, in, in kind of encouraging. Uh, our, our employees to do do volunteer work and, and actually do the things that we're interested in doing. And, um, and I, I don't actually remember if it was through the project or not, or if it was if it was like because they 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 uh, you know a lot a certain amount of overhead hours right. to do you know this. To do. So the company's kind of taken that. Right. Yeah, and, and, and that's what I was wondering. What, things, where does that really end up falling? Kind of, kind of to give Thunderbird a shameless plug. That's kind of what we're well, it sounds like companies do that, and 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 um, you know that's kind of where if we value this public edu public archaeology side of things, um, the companies are participating in that. But it's not, you know, it's still coming from us. It's coming from archaeology, be it CRM, be it academic, you know, that sort of thing. We're, we're the ones sort of pushing that. I'm curious: is there a way we can add a value to that? I mean, like you said, it's building constituency. You know, if we build constituency enough. Well, people want that enough that they'll just build that into, oh, here's an extra little bit so that we can have a public component as well. And I think it's um, it kind of going back to who we convinced that this is exactly. important. I think, you know, the firms that are doing the, the, the you know, the CRM is what, 90 something percent of the archaeology that is actually completed in right. the United States. And most people who think of archaeology, they don't, they don't think about, you know, the guy digging in the backyard. They think about, you know, Indiana yeah. Jones or yeah. mine. Yeah. Tokyo or whatever. But but what I'm impressed with it seems like they, they are fighting the good fight too, you know, the, the companies. As best they can, yeah. given given yeah. the circumstances. Yeah. There are a lot of that are at least trying. Yeah. Well and I think one thing to think about is the uh, pa the power of giving awards. So sort of to Brian's point, mm -hmm. um Alexandria has a city council appointed archaeological commission, actually predates archaeologists on staff with the city. And one of the things that they decided to do in two thousand seven was to start to give awards in front of the mayor and city council every year, Ben Bredman Awards, recognizing certain things in archaeology. I think it was two or three years ago that the Archaeological Commission gave an award to the, the developer of the site where the first ship was found and to Thunderbird, you know, the contract company that was there, you know, because of the outstanding work. And a lot of that was, I mean, there was a public event associated with that project where a thousand people came down in freezing cold middle of January to see you know this first ship that was discovered so I think thinking about the power of awards and, and how you know we can support um, public education components and quality work is, is something um, you know through whether it's through you know your Council of Virginia archaeologists you know your state professional organization or through local organizations I think that's something to keep in mind yeah SHA is a public right archaeology award so consider nominating folks like mm -hmm. <laughs> I think it's also to think very carefully about when you say CRM, it's such a complex world now, even in the private sector. And I don't, I don't know about other regions, but certainly in California, that is now dominated by large corporations that do the cultural stuff, the geology, the natural stuff, a little bit of planning, and a couple of other things. Right? Most of the groups around here are exactly the same. Mm -hmm. And Thunderbird is part of a larger environmental group. So, so one of the things that's interesting about that, at least, and again, in the input that we got from this field work, is that in many cases, the cultural stuff is kind of the most public friendly stuff that any of the rest of the team mm. may be doing. Mm. And so it can be an easier sell to those kinds of companies to take some of that overhead and put it in overtime hours or extra hours to, to do that kind of work, but it's still something that 
in a firm full of geologists, you may have to break that ground culturally in the culture of the corporation, right? Um, to get that sold. And that's also something that the rest of us can have some input on by creating that expectation that that kind of work, the public work needs to be done, right? To some extent. Um, but, and, and this is, I mean, uh, I know there are a few uh, CRM firms that actually have social media um, um, outlets for, for, for accounts for their uh, work. Um, what ways has social media been useful for engaging the public? Uh, and, you know, are any of those strategies more productive than others? So, like, Facebook Live. <laughs> <laughs> archaeology accessible um, and getting it to the people where they're at and what we started to realize is that people are on social media and so that's where I mean even from little things to we use it to advertise our programs when we're having so we'll boost and promote programs through Facebook and um, Instagram we've created when we were doing our video series we created a whole video series around archaeology and we also came to the realization that people are lazy and sometimes a 15 minute video is too long. So we, we created a component where the uh, archeologists would talk about 30 artifacts that were associated with that site. So if you went on Instagram for 30 days of that month, you would also see the artifact and hear them talk about, so it's just a quick little 30 seconds, ooh, I learned. And I actually had people who reached out and said, oh, because I saw that post, I went and watched the video because I wanted to learn more about it. So for us, it became another way of educating people, meeting you where you're at. You don't have to do anything. If you're interested, it'll draw you in. If not, maybe we'll get you next time. And then being creative about it. So like our Instagram, I, I've learned a lot of weird things. In my <laughs> <laughs> I make videos and I will sit there and take a bunch of photos from like the archeology span club with the kids. And if we did something cool, I'll make a video that have like half of a question on each thing so you're watching and it has music going along with it so you're like all intrigued and I'm like oh, I should pay attention um, but it's one way to get parents saying oh look at all these awesome things these kids are doing and it just popped up through my feed so um, for me it's it's major I mean it, it's changed stuff so I've used I've been using Twitter since 2009 so I sent the um, started with the MSU, Michigan State University's Campus Archaeology Program, um, which was a director of the program and a half-time graduate assistant, assistant that was me. Um, so we started using Twitter um, because I was working on construction sites on campus, or I was like, you know, putting in an excavation unit under the bleachers of the baseball stadium, <laughs> right? Like just these random, strangely remote places. Um, and, and was using Twitter to take pictures of what I was finding and send it out into the world, right? And there happened to be, for some strange reason in East Lansing, Michigan, a lot of people who were really into Twitter. There were local tweet ups, right? Where people are on Twitter would all go to a bar, we'd take over a bar once a month and, and meet. So I would go to these things and I would pass out cards with, you know, and people were like, archeology, span what? And of course, many of them are Michigan State alums or staff or whatever. And so now all of a sudden, right, I've got these people sitting in their offices and they've got their Twitter stream open and they're seeing pictures of Terry, you know, out in the snow monitoring a backhoe. Um, but it's at a place that they have memories of and that they've connected to, right? So it was a way to really amplify um, basically a department of one and a half people in a really, really big way to a, 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 a stakeholder group that was really invested in the work, right? And we have alums from all over the world all, all of a sudden who are asking me questions via Twitter, right? So that was kind of how I started using it. And then moving forward, did um, with SHA, we started the social media work that Society for Historical Archaeology does. And the intention there was to figure out a way so that SHA is part of members' lives all of the time, right? As opposed to this weekend. <laughs> and using social media as a means of generating content that would be useful to members and um, demonstrate what the organization has to offer um, and provide resources for those members. 
And then there's the work we do at Montpelier, um, and we've really transitioned into um, using Instagram a lot. Um, and it's the, it's similar. In, in that case, we are trying to do two things. We're trying to maintain relationships with the people who come on our programs and who are part of that family because they leave after a week and they want to know what's going on, right? They're like, I started this unit. I didn't get to finish it. What's, <laughs> keep me updated, right? Um, and then it's also you, as a marketing tool, right, which is reaching people who might be interested and want to come on the programs but don't know that they exist. Um, and it becomes a really wonderful, you know, it's a, it's a wonderful research tool, right? I thought, what is this? I don't know, but we're linked, you know, it's some random metal object, but we're linked in with the metal detecting community and they're like, oh, that's a carriage flow, or, you know, or whatever, it's a button from such and such. So, um, so it becomes this, this really wonderful engagement tool and a way to really spread, you know, become larger than, than you actually are and louder than um, you can be. I mean, we're in Orange, Virginia, that's right, there's not, like a major urban center for us to go <laughs> do stuff. And, and this is a way for us to, to really amplify and make visible the, the work that we're doing. So I, I think, I mean, I've been advocating for it for a long time. Um, so it's not free, like it's not, it takes time. And it's a lot of work to do really well. And it's increasingly less and less free because the, the you know, Facebook, They've all figured out that they can make money. Um, and and so, you know, if you want to amplify your message, it may take some dollars to put towards promoting posts and stuff like that. That's just, you know, it's a capitalist. <laughs> That's what we have live in, right? So, but I, I think it's worth it, so. I think, kind of going off of that, what we found, I'm in Boston, at UMass Boston, and yeah. so we have a contract firm within our program, but we also are, have a lot of close relationship with the city archeologists and with the NCS in our area, the Peabody, and so, building off of their popularity as well. So we follow all their Instagrams, they follow ours, we promote each other. And so in that way, without having to pay for promotion, if you have the city archeologist has yeah. 2,000 followers, say something about one of their students, one of our grad students who's working on that project, we have like Tuesday Thursday on our Instagram and like Spielberg Fridays. And so we'll then promote them and then the CPS is promoting one of our projects in that way. And so working together to very much promote, like they just are doing this like Next week they're doing a go stand around the circle of the Great Molasses Flood Memorial and because we did some GPR with it like last week to find where the I don't know if you know history, but there was a molasses flood. There's a big barrel there. <laughs> and so there's like, ninety people to complete the circle and like to remember it. Um, and so it's like but there's so many people responding to that because we have these great connections with the local other local like yeah. entities that really help you like help each other. Yeah. We're all in it for right. So yeah, absolutely. So uh, I I don't I don't use social media, um, but SA has its own communications manager, which is good because yeah it, it's a dedicated position. It's a lot it, of work. It's, yeah, it's her yeah. full time job, and um, so I don't do that. But as I mentioned earlier, I I get a lot of calls. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right, but um, but we what. I've sort of come to from those calls is that we we need to put more actual archaeological content on social media because that's where people are mm -hmm. and the content that they are finding um, I get some weird phone calls and, and then <laughs> <laughs> when I google the things that they told me about it, there's always a YouTube video behind it that they're weird and and they're not it and um, and so when uh, you know on the side it has all the recommended it, it just keeps going into a strange hole that at some point there has to be actual archaeological content that can kind of yeah. stop mm -hmm. people and, and show like here's the actual process of how we um, you know can figure out uh, these things and so um, while I can't comment on, on how to use social media, I do just want to encourage everybody to please <laughs> put real archaeological content uh, online. Well, and it's, it's this battle between the noise and the signal, right? Yeah, and it's, exactly. it's really hard to penetrate. Um, and, and that's why it requires constant, you know, like I, my, my poor staff, I, I'm constantly on like more, <laughs> like more, more, like every, anything you find, I, like I don't care. It's like there's a, tiny brick like get it up there because it's 
you know that it is it is your 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 kind of doing well while collaboration is fantastic yeah. you're also doing battle in some ways with yeah. with everything else that's out there um so so it is yeah there's just so much of everything out there to i just want to add something real quick so we had an artifacts of outlander exhibit that exploded in popularity mm. And, <laughs> and it took up two years of my life, um, <laughs> which it wasn't supposed to do. It was supposed to be two months. But it's still uh, traveling four it's years fantastic. later. It's fantastic. It was four years later, and I, I like was like, finish the online version, I'm done. Um, but the, so we installed it in the very first library, and, and I went to give a talk. And the community came. I was accosted by Outlander fans and the Panera beforehand. I mean, it was like really a big deal. Um, and it was one of those, like, we're doing creative things. And I was like, yeah, we did a creative thing, and we were not ready. <laughs> um, and, and it was great. But um, so I give this talk, and I do the Q&A at the end, and I always do the Q&A, and I have the artifact table, and I'm going to stand at it, and I expect them to come up because they want to touch things. And this is what I expect in a Q&A. This Q&A went, hey, I just tweeted this to the costume designer, the director of the show, and the author of the books, and the costume designer already wrote back, and she really wants a lot more information about what you did. And I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was like, I, you know, I go back to my museum, and I'm like, does anybody tweet? I don't know how to tweet. And, and, there, and we, were, we were literally, like, we had to have a meeting <laughs> because none of us knew how to even follow this conversation that was happening about us on Twitter because we were all, like, we're too old for this. We don't know what's going on. And, and, and so I'm, like, trying to figure out, like, you know, we had to play catch up. And, and she... Literally, this woman in the audience tweeted a copy of my business card to the costume designer for the show, and she emailed me the next day. And it took us a week to be like, we have to add something to our website to say we did this exhibit. Like, we, I mean, we had nothing. It was just for the local library for two months. Like, we were, we were not prepared. And, and, and so. the calls started coming. We like it next. We like yeah. it. And so we were like, oh my God, we have to turn it into a traveling exhibit. We did it for a case that was in this one library. And so, and, wow. and. And so we, you know, we, and, and we all know social media is a lot of work and that wasn't part of our jobs. And so we clearly were unprepared. Well, anyway, suffice it, to, suffice it to say, the costume designer never tweeted about or never blogged about our project, even though she emailed me to ask us to, because it took us a whole week to get a website written, to figure out what we were going to send her to blog about it. We had to, you know, we had our panels that we printed and we had sewn artifacts to the panels, but we had to Photoshop those artifacts onto the panels so that we had a picture. You know, I mean, it was it was a process. And by then, she was filming season two and she was too busy. So, uh, you know, the whole social media thing is really fantastic, but you have to, like, be prepared that if you, if you explode... You better be like ready for that, or you miss the boat. And mm. it was a missed opportunity for us, but in retrospect, it's still traveling four years later, and we weren't prepared. And I don't, you know, part of me isn't actually that sad that Terry <laughs> Dressbach did not blog about it because I'm like, would it have been even bigger? Like we, you know, and, and so what would have happened? So. Yeah. Um, we I mean, we had people like in New York State asking for it, in Michigan asking for it, and we had to have meetings. Again, are we going to travel it to Michigan? No. Like, we can't, you know, we can't do that. So, so anyway, this, that's my input on social media is like, you know, hopefully you have somebody on staff who knows how to tweet who can train you in these emergency circumstances. Or you get a volunteer who... Yeah, it was. high school students. But let's. But I mean, this this is a real thing, though. Like, social media is not going away. No, it's not going away. Yeah, just it's it's here, and it is it is the way that. I mean, it's the way advertising happens. Every business has it. People are making money off of it. It's not going away. So it's so this is like this is I I think this is a thing you need to learn about if you want to, you know, do public do public work and engage with publics. This is where people get their information. The country of Russia, right, thought that the Russia's using it to try to infiltrate right. 
yeah. foreign yeah. elections. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Clearly, oh, yeah. it is yeah. an effective. <laughs> clearly, it is a, clearly it is an effective tool. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm going to say just, just as a side, there actually is a list with all of the archaeology social media um, hash, like everything, um, your Twitter account, Instagram account, and Facebook. And I forgot what it's called. I think it's like analytical something, archaeology, or something like that. Mm -hmm. But there's an actual site that houses all of our information for real archaeology organizations. So if anybody wants to go to it and see, it has like the address, your information, and all your social media mm -hmm. stuff. Um, you you uh, opt into it? it? Yeah, it's, okay. yeah, it's, it's not okay. It's not a... Mm -hmm. um, I was just, they didn't know if they were just collecting all that. But but my my like my larger point is that is that it's this is not just something that you can like oh we'll just hire an intern and they'll be our social media person or oh we'll just have the college student do it. It's like you need to you need to learn about this stuff. You need to understand how it works, how the algorithms are working, like how marketing on this stuff works. You can do Facebook ads or you can like the Facebook is a giant database of people and their interests. So you can drill down and do a targeted ad specifically to, for us, we could do people who manage tourism Facebook pages, right? I can create an ad that specifically is like, hey, we're Montpelier and you run a tourist blog. And I know that because you said on Facebook that you run a tourist blog and mm -hmm. I can, you, know, you can, that's the kind of targeted marketing that can happen on this. So it's really, that's, super powerful. <laughs> um, I think just like your archaeological site needs a research design, your social media yes. mm -hmm. needs a strategy. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yes. So um, I've been part, when I was at Mount Vernon and with the city, we've been part of two um, social media competitions. One was through the National Trust and then the one with the city most recently was through um, the Virginia Association of Museums has a top 10 endangered artifacts program and it's all about social media votes and and in the end we got second to a broken record um, but but for us the value of this experience um, it, it forced us to come together and create a social media strategy yeah. and and it has had lasting product it was like a shot in the arm you know yeah. it, it also got our page into these other circles that are out there on Facebook so that it's not just archaeologists talking to archaeologists which is great but um, sort of like you were saying, you know, the other affiliated organizations, um, sailing organizations, because we were promoting the ship. You know, we we, we found our stuff showing up in places that we never expected, and therefore, expanding our community online, and that exactly. was that was super helpful for us. So. Yeah. But it's, I mean, it's a profession. It's a job. Right? Yeah, it's, of course. It is. Yeah. A, yeah. Yeah, I'm wondering what advice for social media you all have for people who are doing more ivory tower type archaeology. I'm an editorial assistant at the Journal of Field Archaeology and was recently given the reins on the Twitter account. Uh, and I'm right now, our social media strategy is when, when articles come out, we do a tweet with the prettiest picture and that is isn't of human remains and a one sentence summary of the article. And then we're silent for a month and a half until the next issue comes out. And so, like, but that's really basic. And I'm trying to think about like what we're what we're publishing in the journal, we're publishing for an academic audience um, and a, and a, um, a specialist audience. And so, how like how can organization? What, what's your advice for organizations that are more on that ivory tower side to break that down? I mean, you have a, you have a community already defined, right? That, so that's really nice. Right. You know exactly what the community is that you're trying to serve, right? right? So um, so you know, get into Twitter search. Get into Facebook search and find those people, right? right? Are do any of your authors using Twitter? Like, you know, find that out. Yeah. And what topics are coming up in the upcoming journal? Mm -hmm. Right? Is it specific kind of region of archaeology that's that's happening? Start mm -hmm. looking for those people now on Twitter, right? And then mm -hmm. when that thing comes out, they're following you. You're following them. You can direct message them. Send them the like. It doesn't just have to be post it and hope mm -hmm. that it gets caught in the feed. Mm -hmm. It can be, I know that this person is gonna be interested in this article, just send it to them. Also, yeah. there, there are all these trends, throwback Thursday. So mm -hmm. throw, yeah. throw it back to an old article. Like, do you remember this one? You know, it would be great to pick this back up and because it also helps you sell mm -hmm. journals like maybe from a few months ago that you mm -hmm. may have laying around. Mm -hmm. If you are flash sale, we're getting rid of everything for $10. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> email us for past journals. Or are you a student? We want to help out students. We're giving away free journals at this conference. We'll be mm -hmm. here. Um, 
so like there's a bunch of different things as I've gotten real good at this <laughs> that you can just throw in. ask for people to submit mm -hmm. you know we're still looking for great people are you a student who would like throw it out you know so mm -hmm. those sort of things you can try go, go to uh, Google Scholar and find out who is citing the papers mm -hmm. that are published in your journal mm -hmm. and then follow the people who cited your journal you know, and maybe even promote them. Hey, so, so and so who uh, just published an article that cites our publication, or I don't know, or you know, play on that. We've only got a couple minutes left. Um, Do we? There are two or three questions if we want to try to answer them very, very quickly. <laughs> um, so this is one actually from what we 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 put out a, a Twitter post to just see if anybody wanted to get involved. With the panel, um, how, do, how do we get kids more involved in archaeology? Uh, how, do we, how do we get the schools more involved in teaching young kids about archaeology? I know it's kind of a softball to you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, making it fun, like totally fun. Stop faking like an archaeologist. Like the first thing we want to do is get in. And I do this. This is what archaeology is. This is what stratigraphy is. Um, but to give an idea, I literally taught stratigraphy with candy and cookies, and it was like the most awesome homework assignment ever, because the job was they had to eat it, and they had to write me a one paragraph story about the candy that they found in each stratigraphy layer, where was it, which came first, which was older. The parents were like pee, the kids were like running around off the sugar for a week, because literally all the layers were made from cookies. So it's like I essentially just gave your child a whole bag of cookies, and one layer of uh, river rock made out of chocolate. <laughs> so they had to eat it all and write a paragraph. But for kids, it was like the best science homework ever. Like all of the parents definitely looked at me like, my child really is into this program. Like, you know, I, wow, this is a different way. So trying to think of like creative out of the way mm -hmm. things to do to get the kids, and they'll come. I mean, who doesn't want to eat candy and cookies? As far as teachers, um, we launched a program in partnership with Mount Pillar. Um, this will be our fourth year. We train teachers. One of the things that I experienced um, in going to schools, is I go to schools all the time, and it's great because teachers love for you to come in. One, it means they don't have to learn another lesson, they don't have to do it. So it's always great to go in, but I realized that even though I'm dispelling myths with the kids, the teachers aren't always paying attention. They might be grading a paper or taking a break or relaxing. So then without fail, I can't tell you how many teachers I would have afterwards who would say stuff like, so, we're gonna study dinosaurs now. And I'm like, that was the first thing in the world just ever. We don't do dinosaurs, we weren't listening. So with the training, we bring in 15 classroom teachers. We give them full scholarships, so it's completely free. Like, it's realistically, I mean, we know that this is gonna be a cost of training. They stay for the week. They excavate um, with the archaeologists. They actually learn how to excavate because that also dispels a lot of myths. Once you've done that for four days, you know what goes into it. And then we do lesson plan training. So in the afternoon, I've created lesson plans and I go through with them for each subject matter, math, um, how to teach um, this in a social studies, English. If you teach pre-K, let me give you creative ways of doing this. If you're teaching high school kids, let me give you a way to add critical thinking in and do. And by empowering the teachers, with that actual lived experience on top of the fact that I've already worked out and we've practiced and we've gone through with these lesson plans, when they go back, they're excited about doing it. And we've started a Facebook page. It's a closed Facebook page for all the teachers. So they get to see all the lessons that past teachers have done. But now I also have a community of teachers where, for example, for the triple A's, we're partnering with them to do uh, the National Anthropology Day. So now I have a whole core of teachers that I can take anthropologists into your classroom. And they love it and they value it because they're already teaching these kids about archaeology and it's kind of empowering them a little bit more and giving them more resources. So That's a really fun program for us mm -hmm. too because it's really great when we have a group of people that are coming for a specific purpose. Um, it, it, aside from just we want to experience archaeology, they're, co they're coming with a really specific set of things that they're trying to learn and that makes the program so much more just it adds an extra layer to the to the experience for them which makes it even better for all of us who are working on it too so that's awesome
We at SA also partner with SHA and AIA and some other archaeological organizations to send archaeologists to the National Council for the Social Studies Conference every year um, so that we can communicate directly with teachers and talk to them about integrating um, components of archaeology into the lessons that they're already doing um, and doing workshops usually using um, project archaeology materials. So Project Archaeology is an organization that um, creates curricula with, with teachers. Um, I was also just thinking when we think of getting kids involved, I don't want to think of that as a monolith because what a third grader is interested in is not oh. at all what a seventh grader is <laughs> interested in. And so, you know, um, making sure that, that you thought through and can kind of code switch when you're at an event um, like the Dave Archaeology Festival where there's all different age levels, being able to switch um, and sort of already having some experience with those different levels and, and how to get those kids excited about it because, you know, some of the older ones is a completely different thing <laughs> than the younger ones. And then uh, we're actually a little bit over, but I wanted to get to the plus one. I think we've actually discussed a lot of this already. Laura's here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, what ways can new relationships between communities and archaeology development context keep communities involved in long-term field projects? And to what extent can community mem members be involved in archaeological interpretation? I think we've kind of touched on at least all of these, uh, but if anybody wants to kind of, I guess this is kind of what our forum is about. Um, um, if anybody wants to, you know, add, add a little bit extra or have a, you know, some sort of cold closing statement in, since it's you know, about five minutes over, which is you know, probably where you're going to vibe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll just follow <laughs> FPN's had very good success in, in like with our, I've talked about our, our volunteer programs and encouraging and enabling stakeholders, community members to produce information rather than just consume information. And so I think that that makes it very meaningful to the communities where you know where we are working on interpretation or preservation or whatever the whatever the project may be. And so um, so it, it's it's very much there's there's a give and take there, and it's been very valuable on both ends. Both ends. That's actually mm -hmm. we were one of the earlier questions was about what. You know what is one of the values of, or what, what do we get out of mm -hmm. community archaeology and better research? Yeah, we do better research mm -hmm. when the community is involved, and and there's m many examples. And my personal favorite um, from Montpelier is when we were um, doing a program with the descendant community, and I opened one of the drawers in our study collection. It was all these agricultural tools, with hoes and pitchforks and things like that, and I was like, here's our drawer of hoes and pitchforks, right? <laughs> And they looked at it, you know, and they said, those are weapons. And I was like, what? And they said, I would have killed James Madison if I had a pitch, he give me a pitchfork. Because he, he was holding me and my family in bondage. Right? I'd never looked at a pitchfork that way. Right? But it took their, their perspective to, to think about the fact that their ancestors were being given weapons every day. Mm -hmm. and, and all of a sudden, now I think about those objects completely differently, mm -hmm. right? The fact that Paul Jennings shaved James Madison every morning, literally taking a razor to the neck of the person who owns him and his family, and he has to make this choice every day to not act in violence, right? Because of just how strong and pervasive that institution of slavery is. He knows what the actual consequences of that action are, right? And that just adds this level of depth to the research and to the interpretation that I'm not going to get as like as a as a white man like that is not my not how I view a pitchfork <laughs> right in that context and and it, it deepens the research that we do it deepens the interpretation that we're able to do and the stories that we're able to tell um, and and I think that's you know that, that's been so critical for for us and I think is a really you know really crucial component of, of doing this community engaged work. It's also really important for us to try and build trust. Yeah. And building trust often means closing our mouths and just listening. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're used to being asked to report. Sometimes it's better to just to shut up and, and see what what comes your way and then deal with that. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. again if we're if we're inviting the community in to be a part of our team, you ought to listen to them. Well and being willing to be patient 
to take the time to build up that trust Absolutely. because it's not going to come overnight. Right. Yeah. Decades. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, I, I, I thought that went really well. Uh, <laughs>